Jason here, Clear Creek Farm. How are we doing today? Uh, today we've been asked how we pick our animals or what are we looking for traits for calling animals. So today Brooke will be talking about that. I was actually going through some of our older videos last week. I was reading the, some of the comments on them and this topic was a question that was brought up a lot in the comments. So I thought I would sit down and touch base with all of you on these particular topics. Um, I know I kind of did a video on this like two years ago. A lot of my criteria in that two years has changed as my managing abilities and um, my thoughts about management and the animals themselves have evolved and changed. So I was just gonna try and touch base on a lot of that stuff um, here today. So the first thing I want to talk about is how am I determining selecting an animal and why it's that particular animal stays. Um, I know first and foremost we're a uh, show animal breeder like we that's what we do we produce for the show side of it however I there and there's, there's gonna be an announcement at the end of this video too so um, keep watching for that there are other criteria besides just to go into the show ring that um, I am looking for now this, this has changed in the last I don't know 24 to 18 months um, as my attitude towards the show side has changed a little bit I don't really like where it's heading I'm trying I'm, I'm kind of evolving in that aspect um, I'm, and I'm and in it and I'm also kind of fed up with the whole boar goats aren't hardy uh, they can't you look at them wrong and they fall over dead and that that is true to a point but that is also completely 100% man-made that's a man-made issue because of how they've been raised and how they've been selected through the years and I am trying to change that within my own herd I wish other people would do that too but I guess we can only start with one person so that's why I'm not selecting just for show quality traits anymore I mean I still do obviously I want I want to be able to go into the show ring and do well but I'm also starting to select for other specific traits like hardiness like I don't if I have a if I have a, a maternal or even a paternal line that's just not hardy they have terrible worm counts all the time um, their feet are bad all the time they can't go in the mud because then they get hoof rot or whatever those are the kind of things that I will automatic I won't, I won't, I, that buck is gone. I won't breed to him anymore. That doe is gone. I won't keep her kids because I am trying to make less work for myself by creating hardier animals that can function in the ring, but also function outside of the ring and they don't have to live in a little square pen all the time in order to survive. With other things on top of that, um, you know, for mites um, up here in the north in the winter time because we can't keep our animals clean and it gets really wet. Mites is a big problem for us. Bucks seem like they just get mites every year after breeding season. We have some that don't get mite and them are traits that we need to start going to to keep that problem, I guess, out of our herd. If you don't mind managing mites, parasite, and stuff like that all the time, that's something that you can look for. You don't have to say, hey, I'm done with that trait. But we're starting to see that, hey, this group of goats over here, every year at November, they start getting mites. We're trying to figure out how, to, even though we try to figure out ways to treat that, but at the same time, we're trying to figure out a way to get that out of our herd in general. Yeah, to, to kind of touch base on that a little bit, um, most of the does in our herd that get mites came from a certain sire. And I, I love, I love his daughters. They make awesome kids. I think I'm going to start phasing them out over time because of the mite issue. Um, that's why keeping data is so important. Like, I literally write everything down. I would love to get a, in the future, I would love to to look into getting a digitalized program like microchips, maybe like Flockwatch or something that I can um, just have it all right there instead of having to manually write it out. It would be so much easier. So I, in the future, I'd love to do something digital. It will make it so much easier for me and as in a management standpoint. I'm, I'm not lazy or anything like that, but 
with running a house and the farm and everything else. I just want to make sure that I have things that I don't have to be scrambling around at the last minute trying to figure stuff out. And I like data. I like numbers. I actually love numbers. I love to, I love the science behind all that stuff. So keeping that kind of, those kind of records and that kind of data is like super important for me anyway. But at, at the same thing with the numbers and stuff, if something would happen to Brooke and it came down to Jason managing the herd, it'd be so hard for me to step into her shoes and be able to go out there and know what's going on. I mean, I can take her phone, I can take information that she's done, but it'd be so much easier if we went to a flock watch kind of system or a um, Gallagher system as a small herd and a small breeder, it's hard to justify the cost. Justify that two, three thousand dollars <laughs> yeah. up yeah. front to be able to do that. So we're looking into it. There's a possibility of maybe trying to reach out to them and work with them on a small side because we don't see nobody in this the Borgode industry in general using that, using kind of, that utilizing. Kind of, I don't want to say using, utilizing that kind of technology because it's amazing technology that just makes management so much easier. And this kind of goes along with the announcement that I'm gonna make at the end of the video. Um, something that we're gonna try we're gonna experiment and i'm kind of excited about it data wise it is an irreplaceable information you can't you can't get that information anywhere else now to touch base with the original topic that <laughs> this video is supposed to be about um so as i stated earlier my criteria for selecting has changed over time so now I'm also looking for, you know, the correct conformational traits. I want them to be square, all four corners. I obviously want the nice long necks, pretty heads. Uh, there's, all, there's a reason for that. <clears throat> you know, I want them to have that nice Roman nose because that gives them good nasal passages to get air up in there. I want my does to be wedgy, and that's because when you have a, a doe that's like a cylinder, completely round cylinder, that literally leaves her no room whatsoever to carry kids. Like she is, she's just, there's there's no extra room in there. So when she's wedgy, when she's bigger in the back than she is in the front, that allows her to carry extra embryos, extra fetuses, and also have room for her digestive system and her lungs. A lot of the reason why we're running into toxemia issues, I don't necessarily think it's completely a metabolic issue. I know that's what they say, but from the 10 years that we've been doing this and all the data that I've kept, I have found that it's not just a metabolic issue. I mean, this is like a whole nother video that I could talk about this, and I probably will. Um, so I'm just gonna like touch a little bit of base on on this subject. A lot of the taxi taxemia issues is because we have number one taken away our chest cavities on these does. I mean, we've literally shaved their chest. <laughs> clean off and they're a completely straight line from the top of their neck all the way down to their hooves it's a straight line there's no there's no depth there anymore there's nothing so we've basically pushed their lungs back pushed their digestive system back into the reproductive system which leaves zero room for babies and you can't you can't have a sustainable system you can't have a sustainable industry like that. That's why a lot of people are flushing now because their their does just can't do it. They can't make babies. They can't hold babies in there because that's what we've done to them. So I have completely, if I have a doe that's like that, she's gone. I don't want that in my herd. I want does that can carry their own babies. Um, like I said, I will make another video on toxemia issues because of all the data that I have, it's going to be very interesting. <laughs> Um, but that's one of the traits that I select for. I want wedgy does. I want does with big chest floors. I'm not a deep chest floors. I'm not talking about wide. Width and depth are two very different things. I want people to understand that. Width and depth are not the same at all. You can have the depth without the massive width that we have taken these show does to. 
And these doughs, these wide, super wide doughs, their chests are flat. To me, that's a call trait. I don't breed for that. I want my doughs to be moderately wide. I'm not saying they gotta be this narrow. I'm not saying they gotta be narrow as a sapling. No, I don't want that either. I want moderately wide doughs with that nice deep chest floor to hold those lungs up front instead of back so that way she can carry babies like she's supposed to. I also look for udder traits. I like nice udders. If I have a doe whose udder is super saggy and after the first kidding, she goes. I don't hold on to does that have their udder blows up so big that and the teats blow up so big that you can't feed babies, especially on the first kidding. That's a huge call factor for me. I don't mind if they have a big udder. That's fine. But if it's super saggy and the teats get this big and the babies cannot suck on them, she goes. I don't, I'm not super picky about three teats on one side or a split or whatever. I have found, I mean, and I know that there's people out there that have been raising goats a lot longer than I have. But again, with the data, I have found that babies really don't have that big of an issue sucking off three teats on one side or a split. They, they really don't care. As long as there's a teat with milk in it, they'll, they'll find it and they'll get to it. I'm not, I have not been super picky about teats. And the funny thing about that is you go out and you look at our uh, yearling. They're, they're just turning yearlings right now. And I would say 98% of them are all one by ones. Um, so I think some people get a little too wrapped up in the tea issue. And I think by getting too wrapped up in it and by trying to breed it out, that they're creating more issues. If you just relax and let it be and get your clean teated box and not worry so much about your does, it kind of fixes itself. And every goat ain't going to be show correct anyways. <clears throat> it don't matter how many goats you raise. And a lot of this stuff goes back to even on the commercial side of raising animals. If you're looking to start a herd, um, I think it's one of them things where you still need to look for these same exact traits. You don't need ABGA registered animals to have these traits. Um, there's a lot out there on the commercial market. There's a lot of stuff you can crossbreed to other meat style animals and add these boar goats in there to add the mass and the meat, the, the production um, time-wise to put meat on the ground if that's what you're doing. Yeah, and I think a lot of people especially those just getting into goats or they want to do registered goats. I think they look down on a lot of commercial breeders as inferior because they're not registered, which is complete, it's bogus. I think if a lot of the registered people, the people who raise registered stock would look towards the commercial breeders who do this, who actually make a living on producing meat, uh, I think we could learn a lot from them as to what type of traits we should really be looking for. I mean, I raise show goats and I think the show goat industry has kind of, please don't throw me over the fire for this, saying this, <laughs> but I think they have ruined a lot for the boar goat. I don't think they've made them better because they have, as I've tried to explain earlier, they've taken away the doe's capacity to literally carry their own babies. If she's going to be a good mom, if she's going to be able to carry kids without issues, is she going to get toxemia, whatever, I think that nobody, and this is just me and I know no one's going to do what I say, this is just my own personal opinion, my own personal feelings, I just feel like no one should be flushing until a goat a doe, bucks are completely different. If a doe hasn't kitted at least once, I think I think every doe that's flush should kid at least once, so that way we know what kind of maternal traits she's going to carry. I I, I do I said I don't think flushing's bad. I think there's definitely a place for it, but I do think it has kind of watered down our maternal traits. It has watered down our hardiness of this particular breed how they're raised, it, it's just we're, we're housing them in little tiny six by six pens like their whole lives and we wonder why if they go outside and get wet, they die. I mean, you can't, 
raise them like that and expect them to stay hardy through their through through the the generations i mean you, you keep you keep breeding generations and raising them like that they're going to become less hardy over time and that's exactly what has happened i hate i hate i cannot stand it when i hear oh yeah go boar goats are so unhardy they're not hardy well they can be they can be if you breed that if you breed for that and if you select the certain traits for the hardiness and, and <coughs> how to raise them. I, we, I don't, our goats are well taken care of, but I don't baby them. I, I don't baby them. I, if I have a, a doe or a buck that constantly gets hoof rot or bacterial infection in their hoofs and um, I'm constantly treating them for it, they go down the road too and I don't keep their kids, I don't breed to them, I don't do any of that because I don't want that in my herd. I don't want to have to manage that. It's a pain. That is one of the biggest pains to manage is foot issues. I can't, ugh. Uh, same time and stuff, just like if you're getting goats with diarrhea all the time. We we came to the point where we don't treat them out there in the barn no more if they get diarrhea. Either they're going to work their way through it and they're going to live or they're going to die. Especially if we know they don't have worms, they don't have no other issues um, for us to treat. All you're doing by giving them different things to keep them from having the diarrhea, you're basically, all you're doing is killing their system they need to be able to work through that and be able to come off the other side or they end up dead and they're out of the system and that's where they need to be yeah i don't if if it if an animal has diarrhea for a reason i'll treat it but if it's just spur of the moment oh my gosh um it rained out or something like that i i won't treat it and if then it's kind of up to her or him whatever happens uh because i'm Two years ago, that's I drove myself crazy treating for diarrhea. I, I was so it was it was so frustrating, and I was just putting myself in a bad place trying to treat for diarrhea. And finally, one day, I said, "You know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing this. I can't do this anymore." So I stopped, and I did have a few that you know what they just got diarrhea and they couldn't deal with it, and they they died. I know that might sound cruel but those are traits i didn't want in my herd i didn't want them in my herd and and going back to the toxemia issue if i have a doe who gets toxemia three or four weeks before her due date i won't treat her i'll just induce her because and then she goes down the road because i don't want to deal with that if she can't if she gets toxemia a couple of days before her due date I can deal with that that's okay that's probably not on her those kids are just too big at the time and i'll still end up inducing her but the kids will, will be viable but if they're and I and generally generally I'll take a look at her data and if this is like her first offense or whatever she can stay but if a doe can't can't carry kids three or four weeks before a due date I don't want her around she's got to go so do you, not only do you have to look at conformational traits that you like and the other thing that I will say too is I can't I, I am not a follower. I don't follow fads. I don't follow trends. I don't do any of that stuff. I breed for what I like. Yes, sometimes I get really frustrated because I feel like nobody notices or nobody appreciates what I'm doing or what I'm trying to do. Nobody sees or again appreciates what I'm breeding. Um, but then I do this not to get the approval of other people. I do it because I love it. I love the animals. I like being out there. Um, so that is something else that I've had to kind of work through in my head. It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what I think. If you're out, if you're out there trying to be like everybody else, trying to follow everybody else, trying to follow the trends, oh, I got to have this, these genetics, I got to have those genetics, you're going to drive yourself absolutely insane. Do what you do. Do what you like. Breed what you like. And don't worry about everybody else. As long as you're enjoying the journey, it's all that matters. And just because somebody else don't like what you're doing, you gotta you're the one putting the money in it. You're the one putting the time in there. So don't allow somebody else's opinion to change what you're doing. Right, just a few small call issues that I have that's kind of personal. I will call any goat in my herd. This is not necessarily what you have to do, or just what I do because I can't drive me bonkers. Um, I don't keep goats that scream and holler all the time. If they are very vocal, they leave. And if a goat is extremely mean, 
And if a goat is super mean, if she bullies everybody, won't leave them alone, um, or if she's constantly going over and antagonizing on the other side of the fence and getting everyone to fight, she, she goes too. I, I don't like bullies and I don't like loud mouths. Again, that's, those are just personal calls that I do on my own farm um, because they bug me. There's nothing confirmational or hardiness or trait wise that has anything to do with that. I just don't like loud mouths and I don't like bullies. So those are those are some of the some of the the call traits and uh, the traits that I choose to keep keep in my herd. A lot of it, like I said before, is all to make management a little easier. Hello everyone. I just want to do a highlight real quick. Uh, this doe's name is uh, Loving Hearts. She came from Iowa. Uh, I bought her four years ago, I want to say. This will be her, what is it, her third kitty. Um, she's the mom of Freckles, if anybody knows who Freckles is. Um, This will be her. Maybe, maybe this will be her fourth kidding. I'll have to look at my records, but it's either her third or fourth kidding. Anyway, this doe is what I want all of my does to be like. I'm going to have to go outside. She's deciding. She wants to come out here. Watch out, Reba. This doe is everything I want in a doe. She's heavy bred right now. She uh, She's doing a wheat. You can see she's got a really nice udder. Yes, her teats are not correct on this side, but I've never had a problem with any kids trying to nurse off of her, ever. Um, they've always nursed off of her really well. She's a great mama without being too aggressive. Um, do you see how deep, deep bodied she is? So deep bodied, what I mean by that is from the top of the shoulder down to like right in her armpit area, like the bottom of the brisket. So from the top of the shoulder to the bottom of the brisket, you see how from here to here, you see how deep she is? Look at how deep she is. She can carry a lot of babies without even knowing they're there. Um, she's had triplets. Last year she had a single. Okay, so this is her fourth kidding. Um, last year she had a single buck and then the two years previously she had triplets. Um, and I think she's got triplets in there again. But you can see she's she's got moderate to heavy bone, which is what I like. I love her face. And you can see she's got that nice, deep, heavy brisket that I love. She's not overly wide. Her chest is not flat, but she's got that really nice, deep, heavy brisket, which um, is where like the lungs sit forward in there. So this though, I would take 20 more of her if I could. I absolutely love her. She will probably be here until she dies or until she retires. I will retire her here. Um, she's earned her place for sure. But yeah, so if you can find those like her and Rendezvous is much the same way. You can see how nice and, oh, where's my finger? You can see how nice and deep she is as well. This is what they mean when they say depth of body from here to here. Um, she's not quite as deep as heart but she's definitely there and she's also got that nice heavy brisket that i like and she is heavily boned as well um this girl can carry kids without even knowing they're there too um this will be her third kidding um last year she had triplets without any issues whatsoever she had them on her own um she's got a nice udder she's not due for a couple weeks yet so her udder is not quite as full as hearts is um her mama is actually our big black-headed doe i don't know if you guys can see her she's she's right um this doe here kitted last thursday so a little over a week ago and you can also see she's very deep bodied as well she's got a very nice Heavy brisket in the front. Watch out. Um, she had two huge buck kids. Uh, one was almost 13 pounds, and the other one was almost 12 pounds. There's 
Unfortunately, we lost one. He was just too big. Um, sometimes when they're just too big, they don't, they're very slow to start. But this one here, he's doing fantastic. He's outgrown a lot already. I mean, look at how big he is. And he's just not even 24 hours old over a week. So, um, yeah, he's doing really good. And you can see her udder. She's got a really nice udder on her. I wish all my does had udders like her. She milks out very easily. Um, so, yeah, you can see this is what I like to aim for. This is what I like to breed for. Um, does like her and heart and rendezvous and pretty much everyone here um i don't like the cylinders i don't think they're very productive um so i just highlighted these guys to show you what i was talking about about uh deep bodied wedgie and um wide verse flat chest and i wanted to point out real quick that um she had those big butt kids completely on her own. Uh, she was not helped at all, not pulled, nothing. Um, came out to check on her around 11. Uh, went in, went to bed, checked the cameras around 4 in the morning. And there were two babies on the ground. So she was not helped with their kidding whatsoever. We're going to start trying something a little different on our farm. We don't usually like raise out weathers. Most of the time when we get weathers and that's pretty much any bucket hits the ground around here we either right away either make a decision it's going to be a weather or we're going to raise it out for four or five months before we decide if it makes the cut literally or goes to the stockyards so i'm going to let brooke announce what we're doing and what our plans are for the future we as breeders need to start changing things we're doing because the industry needs to go back to what the actual goats were brought here for. Baby J was not initially supposed to be a show goat um, organization. Yes, they've been they were shown from the beginning, but they were initially brought over here to better the existing meat stock that was in the United States. As Jason said, we usually well we used to when we first started this we rate we pretty much sold all of our butt kids as weathers for to 4-h kids or whatever and a couple years ago we stopped doing that because most of the kids that we were selling to just didn't put the work in um i was tired of animals that we sold going to fairs literally 10 pounds heavier than what they left here. So they weren't getting fed. They they couldn't walk on leads. They couldn't do anything. And I, I was done selling to kids who weren't willing to put in the work. So I'm gonna keep that profit for myself. And we have decided that any buck kids, besides the ones that our girls are gonna take to fair as weathers, because obviously all three, all three of our girls are now 4-H age and they can take weathers to fair. Um, so we'll keep back three, uh, maybe sell to a special person in our club or whatever. But for the most part, any buck kid that we don't want to keep as a buck, and that's pretty much 99% of them, we are going to grow out. We're going to implement a, a program where we grow these buck kids out. I, I, I don't plan on dehorning them and I don't plan on weathering them. Um, they're gonna go. They're gonna go to market. We are fortunate in our location that we have something that we can t we can market these um, goats to. But we're gonna try and grow these goats out. Well, we will grow these goats out until they're around 80 to 90 pounds. And I plan on keeping immaculate data on these guys when they were born, how much they weighed at birth, and I plan on weighing them at least bi-weekly so I can keep track of their average daily gain. I can keep track of how much they're, I'm gonna, how much they're eating, how much feed they're getting. Um, and I'm gonna, at the end, at the end when we sell them and get the check back, I'm gonna crunch all the numbers and I'm gonna see if there was any profit in it whatsoever. I don't necessarily know if there's going to be because the numbers are gonna be low. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing there's, we're only gonna have like 10 maybe to do this with. So it's just an experiment to see how how we can manage this. Uh, I don't expect any 
huge significant results the first year we do it. But I think it I think it'll give us an opportunity to because we get asked all the time, do you have any goat meat? Do you have any goats already to go be sold? for me it gives us an opportunity we have a usda facility not too far from us within a half hour that said they could take in goats anytime i have them um, because goats don't have to hang for a period of time they're ready to be processed within a day or so after they butcher them i think that gives us an opportunity of maybe in the future being able to have usd approved well, meat market directly to the consumer right well, rather than taking them to a market a, a market sale um, that is the end goal but the experiment is just to find out even doing it market marketing directly to the consumer by feeding them out and crunching the numbers to see if it's even profitable yeah profitable viable to even do that because you need I mean when it comes down to it we need to know on a large scale, you'll be able to profit more than on a small scale. We need to know, hey, we made $2 a profit on a goat when it's all said and done with. $2 a profit is $2 a profit. If we scaled this up, are we going to be able to get $20 profit? And until you do the numbers and crunch the numbers, you will never know if you can do it or not. Yeah, for a long time, I was kind of... Push, pushing back on this you know it's never gonna work it's never gonna work you're never gonna make any money on it but then I got thinking about it and thought you know what? let's just do the experiment and let's just see let's just put this to rest once and for all and see see what happens so I'm actually really excited about this we have some work to do out in the barn out in the pasture area where I want to house these guys um, so we're not we're not like starting this right now it'll be started probably but we got three months yeah, we're so just starting like April we'll we're just Start, start. We're just starting the kid out, so we're going to have some time frame here. I know this video has kind of ran long, and we got a lot of off-topic subjects in here, but uh, thank you guys. I just want to thank you guys all for watching. I really appreciate you listening to me. Don't rake me over the coals for my opinions on this video. Um, I just, from where we started, where the industry was when we started, to what it is now today, it's totally different. And I just see the show side of it going stale. There is not a whole lot of growth in the show side because there's a lot of hold back. Um, a lot of people don't want to give up. So they're kind of holding other people back from climbing the ladder, so to speak. So in order to, I don't want to say make this profitable, even make it worth it to a lot of small breeders like us, the people who are starting out, we're going to have to diversify and do other things besides just the show animals. And I think that in the long term, um, we'll be able to reach out to people that are smaller breeders, especially if we get this going where we can do something with it. Reach out to the smaller breeders, reach out to the 4-H kids, and be able to help them move along farther because they're only going to have four or five animals. They might have two or three that they breed every year. Taking to an auction house to sell ends up being not very profitable when it's all said and done with. Yeah, that's well, we can talk about that more on another video. Um, I will talk about the toxemia data on another video. And uh, we were asked to talk about what's the difference between breeding animals and 4-H animals. I'll give you a hint. There's not that much difference. We will, Those are like three upcoming videos that you will see from us. Um, so watch out for those. But with all that said, um, I want to thank you guys. We hit over 7,000 subscribers. Next goal for us is 10. 10, 000. Let's do 10. And then I, I'm hoping every year we've uh, we've hit some major goals when we hit nationals. Three years ago, my goal was a thousand subscribers by nationals. We hit that. Last year, our goal was 5,000. We hit that. Um, we will probably, when we hit 10,000 subscribers, we will do some type of giveaway. I'm not 100% for sure um, exactly what that giveaway will be, um, but we'll come up with something that would be worth you guys subscribing. So please go like, subscribe, share these videos. 
I don't like asking for that. I get told all the time from other videos that I watch that you need to ask for people to support you. Um, we did open up the membership side of it. Um, now, if you want to become a member, we'll probably do like some different things, a live stream for members. We'll have to figure out some things that will be extra videos. Um, we're hoping to get back into this more, do some live stream soon. Thank you guys for coming along. Be the GOAT and have a great day and see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.